I'm picking up right where I left off last week, as I said I would, which was essentially I was going to start talking about field design. Um, just so you know what's happening today, there's actually only four slides left of Lecture 4. So I'm going to do the last four slides for Lecture 4, and then I'm going to make you cry. Then I'll make you cry a second time. And then we're going to do on, uh, I'm going to discuss um, design patterns and whatnot. And if time permitting, we'll do an on-the-board design session, may, not guaranteed. Um, actually, I'll do the design patterns before I make you guys cry, I think. All right. So picking up right where I was last week, I stopped where I was talking about field design. So we discussed various other things beforehand, data types and that kind of stuff. Field design is when you're actually doing the fields themselves and you've created your tables and you're putting in the columns and or fields, whichever word you want to call it. There's some thought that goes into this. And as some of you have already experienced, you actually have to think when you do database. There's, you know, you have to think you do, you have to work with a lot of computer stuff, but with database, you have to actually use the creative side of your brain, not the logical side of your brain. And when you design fields, the first thing is you should make your field names meaningful. Make them make sense. Make them mean what they represent. If you call a field A, and it's supposed to, call it to contain the name of a color, what does A have to do with a color? Make it meaningful. Maybe you're going to call it color. Whether you spell it the American way or the British way, it makes no difference. Just stick and make your names make sense. If you're putting in a column that has to do with a person's SIN number, you're not just going to put in the word number. You'd probably put in SIN number, social security number, whatever, a social insurance number, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, but you're actually going to give it a meaningful name. The need for short field names doesn't exist anymore. Once it was a time where it was useful, there is no real reason. By the same token, don't make it absurd. It doesn't need to be that long either. Some people, as you've discovered, I've had some conversations with some of you during labs, uh, especially for lab three, telling, telling you, why are you putting so much here? You don't need all this if you can just do it with two words. More, less is more, unless you don't give enough. This died on a naming convention and stick to it. You may already have a naming convention that's been forced upon you, such as the one I'm forcing upon you for this course. When you get hired somewhere, unless you're top dog, which <laughs> coming right out of school, the odds are pretty small, you're going to be given a naming convention and you're going to follow the rules. And just be consistent. Try to make an informed guess as to the maximum size the data will be. For example, you have a field called name. It's going to hold a person's name. Would you allow it only be 20 characters long? Probably not. Why? It won't even handle French Canadian names. They have much less, you know, other nationalities whose names are really like that long. Whether it's a Hispanic name or it's a name from India, which is like that long. You know, depending where you come from, your names may be long, they may be short, but try to handle the largest case you can think of. And then name your relations in an appropriate manner. This, by this, I mean name your entity, your tables and stuff. So if you have, make sure that everything makes sense. Don't start giving arbitrary names. Once again, this goes back to naming conventions. Keep everything lowercase. That's for this course more than anything else, but Unless you're working with Oracle, pretty much everything else cares. Don't use spaces. Once again, that goes back to the naming conventions. And that's just not my naming conventions, that's just common sense. Why? The SQL language, which I'll be teaching you guys in a few weeks, uses spaces to separate words. If you put a space in the middle of your, your field name, you have to use what's called a field escape, and every database server does it differently. MySQL uses the backtick. If you don't know what backtick is, it's the uh, character above the tab. It shares it with the tilde. Postgres uses double quotes. Microsoft SQL Server uses square brackets. Every server does it differently. That means you're making life hard for portability. Use underscores. And the last rule is try to stick to basic data types as much as humanly possible. Now, that means use varchar. 
ints, integers, numerics. Um, because not all database servers support float, whereas some of them support reals. Even though technically they do the same thing, they were actually represented slightly differently. Try to stick to the most generic data types humanly possible. Just because a server has cool data types doesn't mean you should use them. For example, Postgres has geometric data types. I can store x, y, r, and it knows what a circle is. It actually has a data type for circles. It has a data type for network addresses, for an IP address. It actually understands the four octets. Should you use that? I don't know. If you're never thinking of ever moving off Postgres, fine, use it. But if ever you're going to go to Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server, guess what? They may not have those data types. Stick to the generics instead as much as possible. It makes your database portable. And it's a bit like, you know, when Android users laugh at Apple users because you live in your little walled garden, right? The, the OS tells you you're allowed to do this and only allowed to do this, and that's all you're allowed to do uh, because Apple says they know best, whereas with Android, you're allowed to do whatever the heck you want. If you start using the fancy data types, you're locking yourself into a specific platform. And the goal is, usually with database work, is you try to make yourself portable so that as it grows, you don't have too much pain in the migration process. All right, so when you're mapping data types to fields, and this is some of the questions actually I was just discussing, how long does the field actually need to be? So give yourself lots of room. Should I plan for slightly larger data? Yes, always. There's no question asked on that one. That's a question, that's a rhetorical question. Is the data text, numeric, date, or time of some sort? It, depending on what it is, you pick the appropriate data type. And if it's a date, what have I said when you deal with dates? What should you use instead of just a date field? The timestamp, yes. Well, it's not always called timestamp, but you use a date time field. Postgres calls it timestamp. MySQL server calls it date time. Microsoft SQL Server, I think, calls it date time. Postgres will actually recognize the word date time and treat it as a timestamp. Why? It, you can always collect the date if all you need is dates, but in the future it may need the time. And it's really hard to invent data when you don't have it. When looking at numbers, does the number contain decimal places, yes or no? How many decimal places of precision should you have? If you're dealing with money, how many places, how many decimal places should you really worry about? Two or three? Three, half pennies. Conversion, exchange rates. You know, when you go from a currency that, you know, one million of whatever that currency becomes 50 cents in the US, you know, those half pennies actually count for a lot, for at least the people where it's, the money's not worth anything. Can the number D be negative? Now, this one's a question that actually applies to MySQL and I think Microsoft SQL Server. They allow you to have what they call an unsigned integer, which means it cannot have a negative value. But it allows you to put in a bigger number when it's unsigned. Because let's say it allows, if you do like what they call a tiny integer, which is uh, up to 999, well, if you have a negative value, then you could actually go 9999 because it needs one spot for the positive negative. But Postgres doesn't let you give you that option, therefore it's always, it doesn't care. Uh, how big can the number get? Is, are you going to use an integer, a big integer, a small integer? What kind of numeric float are you, how, many, how much precision do you need? You're going to use a float as opposed to a decimal place because you need lots and lots of precision. Uh, when looking at times and date, dates and times, once again, I've said store the whole thing. There are cases where you just want the date, but it's pretty rare. Like date of birth. Rarely do you need to know to the second how old someone is. But even that on your birth records, it actually has the time of birth, the official time of birth. You know, the government probably cares. Okay, and then this brings me to um, the many-to-many -many relationships, which is um, the most complicated type of entity 
in a database. Now, when we talk about a many-to-many -many relationship, this is an example of that would be an empl uh, employees and skills. So you have a bunch of people that work for you, and there's a varied skill set amongst them. So I'll go with a construction company. Most people know how things get built to some extent. So let's say you have 10 employees. So you have 10 workers. And out of those 10 workers, you have five carpenters, three guys that can do drywall, two electricians, one plumber. It just so happens that one of the plumbers can also do drywall. Why? Because over the years, he's learned to, that sometimes he has to cut a hole in the wall to get the pipe. And he's learned to patch the drywall. So the plumber knows how to do drywall. They have scared, uh, shared skills. So normally, when you draw, you draw it, you draw it like this. And the diagram would start out like that. However, as cute as that is, it's just, you know, it's a Kentucky kind of relationship where everything's related to everything else. Totally unmanageable. So you end up creating like this. This is known as an associative entity. So if this has an ID and this has an ID, in here you have like such. So an employee can have many skills via this table. Each skill can belong to many employees via this table. If you fire an employee, you can get rid of all their matching skills, but you never lose the fact that the skills existed in the first place. So this is known as an associative entity. This is that the most basic. This is the most simple basic structure. And this used to be really, really popular until something called auditing came around to be. Auditing. Uh, in the U.S., there's something called the Sox Bane. Sox. I don't know. Oxley. Source Bane's Oxley. There it is. Sox. Sox sucks. Basically means that if the data ever changes, you have to know when and who did it. And sometimes why. Every single time something changes in the database, you have to know who did it and why. Looking at this, you can't because you're missing a bunch of things. There's a bunch of attributes, and there's a chain of attributes that have to do with it. So when you have an associative entity and you grow it to have some extra fields, such as created, modified, created by, modified by, on and on and on and on, deleted, deleted by, which means it never actually gets deleted. You end up having something like this, which suddenly these fields have nothing to do with either other table. So now you end up having to throw on its own synthetic key. You have two foreign keys and a bunch of attributes so it's properly normalized. Otherwise, you end up with partial dependencies down here. Because in theory, you could have an employee that had a skill. And suddenly you discovered that the guy was lying. So you take away the fact he had the skill, but you need to keep track that he had the skill. So suddenly you have something called active. Some of you might have rec recognized that, right? Yeah, active, yes, no. It's known as a Boolean. So suddenly the guy's skill is inactive. But then the guy says, well, I went to school and I learned actually how to do drywall properly. So then you re-add the skill, but you don't replace this one so that you can keep track of the fact that he lied. You add the new skill in with all the appropriate timestamps on it and that it's active. This is, for, this is for auditing and logging purposes. When you have something that looks like this, basically a job that serves the purpose, a table that serves the purpose of an associative entity, 
but has extra stuff. It's known as an associative entity with attributes. Woohoo! It's the second one. Essentially, it's a table that joins two other tables and has some extra fields. This associative entity can join two or more other tables. You can have tertiary, ternary, sorry, then then there's ternary plus, which is, you know, three, four, five, six relationships all going to one table. It's a mess, but it happens. This is an associative entity. Now, there's one other entity type I want to talk about, which I don't have in the slides. I'm going to erase this. And is there an eraser? Not today. Great. My wife wonders why I go home, my hands are black. There's one more relationship. It's called the self referencing relationship. A self referencing relationship it means that. Anybody here ever hear about recursion? A term called recursion? It, in programming, yeah, one hand, and I'm sure there's two, okay, three, four, okay. Don't be shy if you've heard the term. It doesn't mean you're smarter than everyone else, it just means you heard a word everybody else didn't hear yet. Recursion in programming means it's a function that calls itself. And it, it dives deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, who here has seen Inception, the movie? You know how you keep diving deeper and deeper into the movies and everything slows down the deeper in you go? Right? And then you come back out and it speeds back up. The recursion does the same thing where each function dives into itself. Now, there's a, something that when you navigate the internet, sometimes you see something called a tree structure. So other tree structures you may have seen is your file system. You open up your C drive and then basically the entire operating system is like a tree. Mac OS tries to hide the fact that it has a tree also, but it has a tree just like everything else. And in the database, if you want to do that, you'd have a normal entity. And it has a primary key. What it does have, though, is It is able to refer to itself. Now people go, well, what does that exactly mean? I could have a category that looks like this. Its ID is one. Actually, it's go. Yes. <laughs> Problem is, I've only got that much board for the recording. Let's go over here. So basically you end up building a tree structure 
And when you're done, if I were to draw it as a tree structure, it would look like this. By following the numbers in this column, it tells you what the parent record is. And it just draws a tree. Currently, there are four database servers that support recursion natively. Maybe five that I'm aware of. Let's add the disclosure of I am aware of. Oracle can do it. Postgres can do it. Microsoft SQL Server, I think, can. Teradata can. Uh, those are the big ones. Uh, MySQL, you try it and it dies. You actually have to write PHP code or Java code to do this manually. So it's query after query after query. Postgres has the capability of actually doing it. It's, it's nasty code to do it, but you can do it. But that's called a self-referencing table also known as a unary relationship. Uno, one, unary. So that is the last weird relationship type that's to be handled. I don't expect you guys to create any of these in this course. They won't even show up on the exam. But I had to cover it. it it's not an advanced topic. Oh, thank you. Napkins, that'll work. It is not necessarily an advanced topic, but it's what I call an experienced topic. So after you've been around the block a few times, it makes more sense. Okay, now, I'm going to erase this, and if anybody's still writing, tell me when I'm good. Going once, twice. Take a picture. <laughs> that works too. I often have students that run down and just take pictures. I don't mind. Eh? You got the concept. So, once you understand the concept, it's not hard. It's just understanding the concept. And most people, the human brain doesn't like recursion. We don't like thinking about things inside of things inside of other things, inside of other things. And theoretically, this has no bottom end. You can just keep going down until you run out of primary keys. And considering you know a, a big integer is number is that big, you'll never run out of categories, ever. Now, there is one danger with this. It's called poisoning this column. For example, this one refers to three, and then you make this one refer to five. You end up with this endless loop of things that, who's the parent? It happens occasionally. And you end up just having to clean it up. All right. Now, I don't need that sc the screens anymore. I'm going to get that out of the way. Today it works. If anybody wonders why I'm putting red lines, that's my outside markers of my camera. <laughs> That's my stage. If I could put my camera another two feet back, I'd get almost the whole board. Okay, now, the next one I want to talk about is, uh, and I'm going to cover this before I, talk, I make everybody cry, um, is patterns in your data. And by that I mean, when you have common data structures, sometimes there's just certain things you need to 
um, put in. And by that, I mean the first pattern that everybody recognizes is an address. Often you'll say, well, make sure you collect the customer's address. Now, what does that mean? Normally, it means you need a name and you have an address. I'm not writing this in French today. However, usually you need two lines for addresses. You have address one and address two. I'm going to write this uppercase so it's easier to read for the people at the back. Normally you'd write everything lowercase, but. Why do you need two lines for address? Anybody want to take a shot? Why you need two address lines? No, not for the postal code. Ah, nice. No. <laughs> yeah, for example, unit number, suite number, apartment number. Uh, that kind of stuff would usually go on the second line. Uh, sometimes there are places that are the addresses are a little more complicated. If you need to actually just find out certain certain chunks without the other pieces, like all you want is a street address without unit numbers or PO box numbers or any of that, then yes. Otherwise, it gets gross trying to slice the data. Um, you always need a city. And depending on where you are, city means different things. For example, here in Ontario, did you know the meaning of the word city changes if you're south of North Bay or if you're north of North Bay? There's a city called North Bay, halfway in the middle of Ontario. South of North Bay, a city is a place that has more than 17,000 people. North of North Bay, a city is somebody that has more than 5,000 people. Totally meaningless information. However, the meaning of the word city is vague because some places it could be a village, it could be just a township, it could be any number of things. Why do we use city? Because it's the most common term. A city is a city. A town is a city. A village is a city. By the same token, a village in China can be a million people. Whereas that's a metropolitan in Canada, right? So even that, the meaning of the word village doesn't mean the same thing. I was shocked when I found out a village in China was one million people. I, I was talking to a sales rep in China. That's what they said. I come from a small village. How big? One million. <laughs> How big's your hometown? 9,500. <laughs> oh, that was like my neighborhood. <laughs> like four blocks. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Power to you. Um, we have a province or a state or a county or something else, eh? Territory is another one. Depending where you are in the world, that last thing over here changes name. I have often heard it called political division or political territory. Um, normally, province state covers 80% of the world. The, whatever it is you put in here, pick it and stick to it. But essentially, this is the pattern here. Then you have a postal code. We all know what a postal code is, unless you're American. It's a zip code. And by the way, the zip code is also known as a postal code in the States. Just they call it a zip code because it's faster. And I can't spell. So, and then the country. This one, depending on your database, is optional. Not really anymore, because very rarely will we create a database that's only for one specific country. This is the pattern of an address. There are certain things you need to keep in mind. For the address, you want to use a VAR car. Why? Because you can put in all kinds of letters, numbers, and miscellaneous other characters. How much room do you want to give yourself? Believe it or not, I recommend 150. 
Why? Depending on what language you're using, right? Did you know an A in English is one byte, but in Chinese could be four bytes? And therefore, for every, I'm using Chinese, I'm picking on the Chinese today. I usually pick on the Japanese, but I'm picking on the Chinese, I don't know. But most languages that use um, that kind of characters end up having what they call multi-byte characters. They need more bytes to represent their entire alphabet. So that means that instead of 150 characters, which you could handle in English or you know Russian or Spanish or whatever, 150 characters, you could take this number divided by four, and then that what gives you for Chinese, which suddenly brings you down to about 40, 30, right? So give yourself 150. Same thing for the second one. Why? Why not? City. Actually, believe it or not, usually somewhere between 50 and 70 will take care of it. As a rule of thumb, give yourself an extra five, unless you're in England. Why? Have you ever seen what Welsh town names look like? Especially when the ones where there's a town near another town. Literally, that's how they have their this village near some other village. <laughs> and yeah, the city names get like that long. It's absurd. And if anybody here has ever seen what Welsh names look like, it's about, a, you know, it's about 35 consonants in a row with one vowel. Then they have the word near. And then another 30 consonants. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, that's how bad it can be. Give yourself 75 spots for your city. Yes. Why? Elegance. Simplicity. Your data types should indicate what goes into it. If everything's card 255, how do you know what's actually supposed to go in there? How are you supposed, to, it's just basically, just like you look at a form, right? By your argument, you could say, okay, here's the paperwork for your registration. You get one whole page for your first name. You get one whole page for your last name. <laughs> Why waste the room? Yes, we have lots of room on our hard drives. There once was a time where this was really important when we were talking about hard drives in megabytes. But did you know databases are getting really freaking big nowadays? And the more information we have to track because of government oversight, you know, all the auditing logs, and now that new crap that's happening out in, the, in Europe where we have to add, you know, the, wait a second, I forgot to make, you, make sure you know your new privacy statement. I'm, like, I'm, I'm making a joke. People didn't get it. How many times have you been bugged about the privacy statements in the last three weeks on various websites? That's because of your UK, the European laws just changed. And they're making everybody's life a living nightmare. All those, are gr all those times people say yes, it uh, eats up space in your database. Actually, your database gets really, really big for stupid reasons. Why waste space? That's the answer why you want to put limits. Province, state, and county, other, whatever. Realistically, this should be another table. You don't want to let people type this stuff in. You let the administrators type this stuff in. So what do you end up with? like such. You have another table. And again, how much room should you give yourself over here? Fifty is usually enough. So it's, what about city? Somebody said something, city. Yeah, no. Fifty is usually enough for the name of most political subdivisions. Uh, honestly, I've seen some systems that give you up to 150 just to be to make sure there's no limits. So 50 to 150, they all work. You have to take into account what data set you're working with. 
wet data you're working with. If you're dealing with just North American, that's good enough. And some people get really clever. Instead of this, they do this. The two letter code for the territorial subdivisions. ON for Ontario, BC for British Columbia, FEL for Florida, NL for Newfoundland. Whatever. <laughs> and MAs for Massachusetts. Depending what country you're talking about. So suddenly you just brought a wrinkle, right? Different countries share the same country, the same codes on this. I'll get to that in a minute. Postal code. Depending where you're in the world, the size of your postal code matters. In Canada, it's six or seven, depending if you can include the space. Same thing with Australia and the UK. Right? K1K space, 1K1. In the US, it used to be five. And then they realized somebody had done screwed up. So you'd have one entire postal code for a million people. That didn't work. So they created sub-postal codes. So that's why you'll see American postal codes now, like 90210-5432. Because somebody didn't think that you know, they'd run out of postal codes when they came up with American zip codes. So... The Americans, so now for American zip codes, you've got to give yourself 10 spaces. How big are Chinese postal codes? Some one said seven, one said six. 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 Right. And so six. Uh, there's other ones that are bigger places in the world. Some places are smaller. Uh, you know. New Zealand has four characters for the postal code, depending where you are. So for your postal code, just give yourself 10. That way that covers pretty much everyone. Country. Should you let people type in the name of their country? And never. Why? Because Americans can't decide what they call their country. Just so you know, Americans don't know what to call their own country. We used to allow, where I work, we used to allow free-form country entry. People typing whatever they wanted. We had United States, United States of America, U.S., USA, U.S.A. <laughs> U. I even had this one. U.S. of America. <laughs> right? So you would end up with just the U.S. We had 10 different spellings for just the United States. It was awful. And then Canadians, we had CA, Canada, and CAN. CAN do it. Right? So what do you do with the country? Same deal you do with the states. You create a reference table. ID and name. Again, here you choose whether you're going to do a lot of the two-letter code, the three-letter code, or the full name. Some people get mad if you don't let them type in their full name. But then again, you get other places where they can't make up their mind what their country's called. You laugh. Yugoslavia, what are they called now? Five different countries. The countries break apart. Odds are most people will stick to either to a name or they'll just use the country code. You, your choice. Some people will store both, just for argument's sake. Which leads me to person says where we share the same state code in multiple countries. MA, for example. Massachusetts in the US. I don't know what it is in other countries, but you know, M, uh, uh, Manitoba, MN. MB, Manitoba. Oh crap, I was messed up. I'm Canadian, I couldn't get it right. Manitoba's MB. So what you do, you do this. And you spell it right. So that you end up with each state has a country ID. 
That means you can share the name as long as the combination of these two is unique. Which it ends up being into somewhat more advanced types of indexes where you can make compound in unique indexes, whatever. But realistically, if you write your application code properly, it's not a problem anyways. But so that means you can have MA in more than one place, MN in more than one place. Once we make we cover all the different divisions around the world, you can have many repetitions in here as long as they're uniquely identified to the right country. It also allows you to get clever where you can pick your country and it automatically populates your drop down for your states. That's one of the best things I've seen recently is people, when you go to place an order, they actually put the country near the top instead of the bottom. So then they start auto-populating and adjusting the field labels so it makes more sense for the end users. So they're typing in what they're used to. You know what confused Americans get when you tell them to put in a postal code? Half of Americans don't know what that is. It's not that they're dumb, it's just they've never learned the word. Postal code means zip code in the US. So they actually substitute this on some forms I've seen where they substitute postal code for zip code when you pick United States. It's usability. It's extra work for the programmers, but it makes it so much more usable. Yes? If you're doing with the name of the country, believe it or not, you need like 100 characters. Give yourself 100 because there's some countries where um, they actually require you to put in both the English and the French names. For example, the Ivory Coast, the name of the country is Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. They actually require both the French and the English names to show up in all their forms. Why? That's just how it is. Other, there's a few other countries where, they, you know, the Democratic Republic of, insert country here. That is the name of the country. That's a really long name for a country. Give yourself lots of room. I mean, hundreds lots. It just makes data entry a little easier. So this is the pattern for addresses. You know, I just spent literally 10, 15 minutes talking about just addresses. But this is actually one of the most common patterns you'll ever deal with. When you have somebody tells you to create a database design, they say, what are you going to track? Person's information. What kind of information? Their address. Cookie cutter. You're going to go, Dan taught me this. I'm going to go flip through your old notes and you go, I know exactly what structure I need to use for this. And this structure will cover you 99% of the time. There will be the odd edge case, but that's life. That's why, that's why you have to actually find out what kind of data you're dealing with. So that's countries and addresses. Take a picture. I'm standing off camera. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, the, the yeah country would be going like this. Postal code's part of the address. Just so you know. And as an aside, never ever, unless you're a postal service, create a drop down for city. Don't do a reference table for city. You're gonna have a hell of a time. Because like I discussed this already, I mean you got even cities can't make up decide what parts of it are called. Sure, but even if we look at Ottawa, is it Ottawa, Canada, Nepean? Well, Ottawa is the regional municipality. Even if you take any address inside that square that encompasses Ottawa, and you put in Ottawa, the mail will get to you. But you could also say, well, actually, I live in Canada. You could actually go, Canada, comma, Ontario, and your mail will still get to you because Canada is a subdivision of Ottawa. So how would you decide, how would you decide what the right choice is? How about the fact that there's uh, more than one Ottawa in Canada? There's also an Ottawa in Illinois. And there's an Ontario in California. 
city names are not unique. Unless you come from a place with a really unique city name, like Kappa's Casing, which I can guarantee is not repeated anywhere else in Canada, the, your names are not guaranteed to be unique. Even inside the same province. Like my home used to be called McPherson. We used to get Manitoba's mail. McPherson, Manitoba. So they renamed my town. Yeah. They, they, McPherson became Kappa's Casing. Take a guess which one was harder to spell. All right. Now to cover miscellaneous other data types. Or types of data, I should say. Phone numbers. Haha, <laughs> my second favorite topic. Phone numbers suck. Why? All right. A phone number in Canada looks like this, right? Or does it look like Which one's the correct formatting for, for a Canadian phone number? Technically, that one. However, the accepted format is either this or this. This one is when people try to get creative. This one is when people get lazy. Now, you know what the big problem with all this is? Is how do you store this in a database? And depending on what you, oh yeah, is it this or is it? Is there a space or not after the bracket? I forgot there was one more. Which one's the appropriate one? Technically, both of these are appropriate also. Now, when you go to store this in the database, there's a few issues with this. Number one, the brackets and the dashes, can those actually, you can never store this as a number. Like says a phone number, so I'm going to use an integer. Hot damn, no. Why? I know this will actually make more sense when we learn SQL later. You can't do a substring search on an integer. So let's say you're trying to find all the phone numbers in the 613 area code. Do you know how hard it is to tell it to find me all the integers that start with 613? You actually have to convert it to a string. And then tell it to grab the first three characters. And then do the compare. So what do you store it as? We go back to our good old trusty Var car. How much room do we give ourselves? Okay. Before we choose how much room we give, we have to make some basic decisions. Do we want to store uh, the special characters or not? Because you know we could store it just like this and then we format it on the way out. So when we pull it up on a web page, we actually put in the brackets and we format it so it's pretty. And we let the end user type it in whatever way we want and then we strip everything off but the numbers. We can store it like this. So if we're just dealing with North American phone numbers, you can get it with 10. Other countries, not so much. Yes. That's what I was just talking about. Yes, you can use a mask on the form to force the, the formatting. More s the modern web browsers support masking. Up till two years ago, masking a web browser was painful. Application with masking was easy. So if you're doing in C Sharp or Visual Basic or insert language here, it was easy to do your mask. On a web browser, a web page, it was actually quite challenging because it didn't work in all the browsers. Thus, your experience degraded across the browsers. So realistically, you let them type it in whatever you want, and then you clean it up yourself after the fact. And you store these. So 10. 
However, let's say suddenly our database, we're happy we've got 10 digits. Suddenly we have to start calling people in the UK. We have to add 044 to the beginning. Why? Because you've got to dial 044 before you call the UK. You know, here when we dial 1 and then the rest of the number, saying it's long distance, technically what you're doing, you're typing in country code 1. And then the rest of the digits. Because, you know, we, the telephones were invented in North America, therefore we're number 1. It's just literally how it happened. There's no, no other mystery. That's just what it was. The UK apparently were 44th in line to get the phone. So as you go, the country code adds three more digits. International phone numbers suck because nobody has a set format. Every country does it their own way. So you end up having to give yourself extra room. How much more room do you give yourself? I honestly don't know. Uh, usually I, I go to 20. I allow 20 for a phone number. Unless I know for a fact it's North America only. Then if it's North America only, 10. So the rule is as follows. 10 or 20. NA, international. So either North American or international. If you have to do international phone numbers, give yourself 20. Strip out all the characters when, you, when it gets stored. It's not the database developer's job to worry about stripping out the characters. It's the application developer's job to worry about it. But strip it. When it's stored like this as a string, it allows you to search for certain patterns. You can say, I want everything that's 613555. So you want to find everybody in a certain area. And by the way, 613555 is a fake phone number. 613555 is the same thing as calling 411. For those of you that don't know what 411 is, that's called operator. I don't know a person's phone number. When you used to be able to call the operator and say, I'm trying to call Dan in Kappa Scasing. And they go, let me connect you. Click, and then they charge you a buck. That was the operator service. You can call anywhere in Canada if you know the area code. 1-902-555-1212 will connect you to um, operator services in Nova Scotia. Just so you know. So phone number is 10. All right. Email. It's a fire car. And you want to give yourself lots of room. For example, when I used to work for, hang on. I guess it was Compaq at the time. Couldn't remember if it was digital or Compaq. I was there during the buyout. Whatever one I was. The company I worked, the division I worked for supported uh, applications. So I wrote the software for the technicians on the phones. And it was called User Application Support or Universal Application Support. If you bought uh, 200 PCs from digital, if your company bought 200 PCs from digital, they'd arrange for you to get like 100 free calls to our call center for help with like Word. Or Excel. So instead of having to call Microsoft, you could just pick up the phone. The auto hospital, for example, they could put up the phone. They called uh, some four-digit extension. It would connect to Bell's Corners. And one of our technicians would answer the phone saying, UAS support, what can I help you with? And they go, I can't get word to save. And the technician go, bang. But, you know, that's what they did. Now, I'm heading somewhere with this story. One of our customers was a division of the government of Ontario. There once was a time the email addresses of the government of Ontario were really, really special. They, went, they were formatted as follows. Full last name. Period. Full first name. At. Division. French dash division English period Ontario dot O N and I don't know why 
Gov. Eh? Yeah. Okay. And I'd written this call track system for these guys, and this person, when I had tech going, I can't enter this lady's email address into the system. I'd allocated 75 characters for the email address. Her last name was Beauchamp Dash Boudreau. Okay, in case you don't know, I'm already at 20 something letters. Dot Joanne Dash something else. I don't remember whether her last name, her, so her full name was almost 40 characters by itself. At service à la clientèle dash client service dot ontario.win.gov. No, there's not those dot ca. Thank God. <laughs> it was actually more characters than 75 characters that I allocated. This was an extreme example of you know ed what they call an edge case. So what did they put in her email address? C notes. And then her email address was in the notes. And they, when the technician asked her, how well does that work for you? She goes, Wait, I never get any emails. <laughs> Unless I've emailed them first, I never get an email. Because people just won't type it in. It's too long to type. So how much do you give yourself for email? I've learned to double it. Give yourself 150. Why? Because it's just easier that way. You know, in Japan, what did they use? They, most people have numbers for email addresses. I think it's the same in China. Why? Moon runes don't work very well at email addresses. Most mail servers don't like routing, you know, Asian characters. It just doesn't work. So you end up with those special numeric phone numbers, right? At QQ. <laughs> I know, I do know. Believe it or not, I actually do know. Do you know how many times I've had to actually reply to a number at QQ and go, who the hell am I talking to? <laughs> no idea. Email, 150. Why? Because it's better that way. Yes? Oh, no, no, these are just types of data. I'm just talking, if you're dealing with phone numbers, do this. Normally it would be called phone. Like that. Now I'm talking about data types. Now these aren't tables. Um, those are the big ones, believe it or not, when you deal with common patterns of data. Uh, other patterns that you'll sometimes see is prices. And that's actually an entire structural pattern. Everybody done taking pictures? Whew. Going once, going twice, gone. All right, so the next one I'm going to talk about is not a pattern specific to a type of data. It's actually a structure. And how many of you here have some sort of business training or accounting? Okay, right. So when I went to school, computer programming courses were usually part of the school of business, which meant for a first term, you know how you guys have your electives, so you have to take those stupid fluff courses? You know, appreciation of science fiction. Native American music. Wine tasting, by the way, that's the best one. Wine tasting, if you're allowed to drink, that is. Wine tasting is the best course ever. It fills up in like 30 seconds. <laughs> so, you know, when it's time to pick your electives, don't wait if you want that one. There is a course fee. You gotta pay for the booze. Um, but it's a good one. You go home feeling good every day. <laughs> now, you're not supposed to swallow, but the teacher doesn't actually watch. So, um, is, if you've taken business, you might have heard about the, the, the V, the V structure of business. And what is the V structure of business? It is the structure that determines how orders and or invoices are built. And it goes as follows. And you guys have actually done this already, you just don't realize it. I made you guys do it without actually explaining what the structure was. You have 
Customers. You cannot have a business unless you have customers. You also tend to have products or services. You can't be a business unless you're selling something, right? A customer places an order. Can a customer place more than one order? I sure as hope, hope so. Can you buy more than one thing with every order? You have order lines. What do you buy in the order lines? Usually products and services of some sort. It's a V. The top feeds down to the bottom. Now, each of these have certain pieces of information that go inside of them. Customers, they have phone numbers, addresses, and email addresses, usually at a minimum. I've already covered that in detail, so I'm not obviously going back through it again. When you talk about orders, an order has specific things. An order, and I'm going to change colors here. I wonder how good my markers are doing. That one's good. Okay. Orders have an order date. When was the order placed or when was the order received? We need to know when. You cannot run a business unless you know when. It's impossible. When did that order come in? I don't know, 10 minutes ago, five days ago? Uh, who cares how pissed off the customer is? Other things on, the or on there is sometimes you want to go about the shipping date. Maybe the shipping method. Those are things you always see on orders. What are ship what's the shipping method? FedEx, UPS, you know, Intelcom. Take your pick. Those are shipping methods. What other things do you have on an order? Sometimes you have salesmen. You have terms and conditions. There's a variety of things you put on here. Some of these become optional depending on your system. For example, Payment term. That's one a lot of people, when they haven't dealt with business before, don't understand. For example, we buy a lot of our computers from a company called Windswept. They're just upstairs from us. I need a new computer. I just e email the guy. I go, I need a new workstation. My budget's four grand. He sends me a quote. I go, oh, good. It's better than the last one. I want to buy it. The computer shows up at our door three days later. However, we get a bill 30 days later. Payment terms. When you see an invoice and it says net 30, it means it's due in 30 days from the printed amount. Same thing with your phone bills, Bell. For example, they have a payment term of net 15. In other words, technically your, their bill is due 15 days after the billing date. Those are payment terms. Sometimes you don't even see this on the invoice, you just see a due date. And how do they calculate the due date? Ship date plus payment term equals due date. Those are some of the basic things you find inside of an order. There are a bunch of other things you'll find in there too. Like I said, employee num employees, sales reps, uh, PO numbers. Purchase order number, PO number. How many of you know what a PO is? There you go. The same people I said, do you know something about business, said they raised their hands. It's funny how that pattern matches, right? A PO is a purchase order. It's a piece of paper that the accountant lets you sign off on to say you're allowed to buy something. You give the number at the other end, and then when they send you a bill, it matches what you told the accountant you were going to spend. Otherwise, then the accountant has words with you if it doesn't match. All right. So when we talk about products and services, often you have the name of a product. The, 
The suggested retail price. Those are the two common things you'll see in most products. You'll have other things in here like, could be a barcode. Or a UPC. If you don't know what a UPC code is, anybody here got a box with a barcode on it? Flip it. Or did you ever go to the grocery store and you type in 4011 on the self-serve? Do you know what 4011 is on the self-serve? Usually if somebody, at least one person in the room knows what 4011 is, it's bananas. You go to Loblaws, you put the bananas on the scale, you go product 4011, beep, bananas. It's the only one I know. <laughs> but, you know, there's codes depending on what kind of industry you're dealing with. Uh, most grocery stores will store it all as one. The barcode or UPC, they don't have either or. Um, they could have a description depending on what kind of stuff it is. The other thing you might have is a unit of measure. I'm just not writing it out because my handwriting's so bad. Unit of measure per box, per pound, per kilo. Bananas are sold by the kilo. Fruit Loops are sold by the box. So these, this is basically the basic set that you find in pretty much every products table. There's usually more than this depending on your business. But this is the basic one. There's one last one. Is it taxable? Some of you may not have realized you don't pay tax on children's clothing in Canada. Anything that's considered child size, you don't pay tax. If, and you also don't pay tax on, on food you have to prepare yourself. That includes frozen meals. Frozen lasagna technically is not taxed. The bag of chips on the other hand is junk food, it is taxed. If you go buy a pre-cooked meal at the hot service counter, it's taxed because they cooked it for you. Taxable, yes or no. Those are the big ones that you find in almost every system. Which leads me to order lines, which is the last bit of the patterns I'm going to talk about. Because order lines is something that applies also for invoices. And in here, normally you have an order ID. Why? Because we need to know what order is for. We need the product ID. Because we need to know what we sold. We need to know the quantity, how much of it did we sell. Now, I've had lots of people argue with me saying, that's all you need in the order line. Technically, you could also add notes, though, you know, a little extra little bit of information, totally pointless. But, you know, some people add a note. And they say, that's all you need in order lines. I go, really? You sure about that? You can always override the price. That means you need to store the price, but there's two reasons why you want to store the price. Because the price can change. For example, you went out last week and you bought bananas, code 0411, and 4011 I mean, and you paid 49 cents a pound. This week it's now sitting 5 cents a pound. You need to know when, how much you paid for the price for those bananas at that point in time. You need to know. If you don't know, at the end of the month when you do the calculations where you go quantity times risk, risk suggested retail price, your numbers are all skewed because it's not the price at that point in time. The price here is known as PIT data, point in time data. It's an acronym known in database called PIT, P-I-T, point in time. The price is stored. So quantity times price. Another one you'll sometimes see. The discount. How much did you how, how much of a discount are that you giving them? Which leads me to the last one. Yes? The price? Well, no, what happens is, for example, you go to Loblaws, right now, we all, we'll all take a, a little trip down to Loblaws. 
We all walk to Loblaws. Dan grabs a bunch of bananas, slaps it on the scale. I type in 4011. What it does, it, looks the, it look, does an immediate product lookup. Looks at the price and fills it in. Then, but you bought one of those batch of bananas that has a 50% off sticker because they're a little bruised. And then you press the button for there's a discount on this, and then the guy comes over and he you know, does the override for the discount. And then at that point, he applies the discount here. Unless, you know, there's other places where you can literally type in a new price. Uh, the price is set at entry time, and it's volatile, as in it can be changed right up to the point where the transaction is closed. The price comes from that table, as in from a lookup, but you don't, you don't go three ninety nine. you say bananas. You pick the product, and it tells you how much it is. So that's the price, and then you got the discount. Did that answer your question? Maybe? Yeah. The last one we have on here, which confuses a lot of people, because remember I was talking about the uh, normalization and proper design? And when you're going through the steps of design, you get rid of the calculated fields, right? So magic fields where you can calculate the value if you can express it as a mathematical operation, as in what is your current age now minus date of birth? Gives you how old you are. How much was that line total? I don't know. The extent of the, the quantity times the price minus the discount gives you the line total. And people say, well, those are calculated fields. Therefore, you don't need to store it. There is a reason to store, and this one's the one time where you break that rule, is you store the extended price. My hand's getting tired of writing. My handwriting is going south. The extended price, that is the calculated price for every line item. So it's basically the quantity times the price minus the discount gets stored into extended price. This breaks normalization rules. This is when you remember I was talking about denormalizing for performance. You do this. Now, some people say, well, why would you want to do that when you can calculate it every single time? I just remember hearing a conversation in the lab about why you don't want to nest a loop inside a loop inside a loop because it eats too much, right? Bad programming habits. And you. We're discussing about, you know, keeping your code clean next to the one they were talking to disappeared already. But what happens is if you have to do this every single time, you got to get the database server to do the math every single time. So that means you're going to go, I want to know what my sales totals were for the day. There's two ways you can do it. You could go sum and just add up all the extended prices for that order date and bang, it's one line. It doesn't, it only needs to do the one calculation. On the other hand, if you don't store the extended price, it's actually going to go for every line. It's going to go line number one, calculate the extended price, add it to the previous total. Line number two, do all the math again, add it to the total. Line number three, add it up to the total. That means it's got to do, you know, three, four, five math operations for every single row of data. And then it sums it all up. So you're just spiking the amount of unnecessary CPU usage. Now, if you're a company like, I don't know, Shark Robot or Redbubble that sells, you know, maybe a thousand t-shirts a day, 1,500 t-shirts a day, you don't need the extended price. If you're Walmart or Amazon, eBay, whatever the other ones, the other sites that are out there, Wayfair, the amount of transactions they have in a given day warrants the extended price. Therefore, realistically, there's no reason not to do this. And you can honestly put this programmatically in so that the database takes care of this price automatically at the end of the day. So that it's not, you're not trusting the programmer. As long as your rules for the discounts are consistent, you don't have to trust the programmer for this. All right, so that's the business V. When you talk about, and you can substitute the word orders and order lines for invoice and invoice lines, or for receipt and receipt items. These words are interchangeable. There's a bunch of different words that mean the same. They don't mean the same thing, but they can be used interchangeably, depending on what your use case is. And people are taking pictures because they know I'm about to move on. Because that sounded like a Dan summary statement. 
Because it was. Yes. Sometimes. That depends. Depends on your business model. Uh, well, yeah, but the idea, but you can get the name from the ID. When I teach you guys SQL, you'll see well that makes sense. Yes. Pardon me? If you're doing full auditing, yes. If, oh, I guess I could talk about that for a second. Okay, let me erase this. Uh, wasn't actually planning to, but I'll cover it. I usually cover this kind of stuff a little bit later in the term when I've got gap, but I've got a few minutes still. Because the, the second I finish with this, I'm going to make people cry, so, you know, I'd rather hold off. All right, auditing, which is the whole date timestamp business. Normally, you have a created, which is a timestamp. <sighs> Handwriting's too small. So you have a field, and realistically, Pretty much every database I create nowadays has all these fields on every single table, even reference tables. Why? Because we might get audited by insert government agency here. You have created. You have modified. Also a timestamp. That some people also had used the word updated instead of modified. When was the last? So created is when was this record created? So this could have been created yesterday. Modified means I went in today and I changed the person's name. I fixed the spelling on their name. The modified date will then update to match the last time that record was touched. Created by. Now, there's a variety of ways of handling this, but that should be the username or the user ID of the person that actually created the record, which means you also have to have as in who's the last one to touch that record, which leads me also to now we now have to have something stupid called deleted because we're not allowed to actually delete a person's data unless they give us explicit permission to delete their data. This is known as a soft delete, as in you delete it, the, da the application no longer sees it, but it's still in the database until further notice. Again, that's also a timestamp. I'm not putting a data type next to these because depending on what your data structure is, this could actually be a string, or it could be an integer, or it could be something else. Um, do you notice I didn't put in a deleted by? I, you could either use deleted by or you could use modified by because when you add the deleted, that means you updated the record. That means the last person that modified it is the one that deleted it. You can piggyback this one to save yourself you know, a little bit of code. Another one you'll see is active. Not as common. Uh, that's usually just for products and stuff, not on all the records. Well, so... These are the, what they call basic auditing fields. So who did what? No, who, who, when, no what. But normally you can guess the what. If it's just the created, but the modified, if the created and the modified match, that means, you know, it was just created. If the created and the modified are different, that means, you know, the, the record change of modified changed. Those are the big ones. The catch you have, though, is sometimes you have multiple changes and you end up having to have a separate, a full auditing log. And what does an auditing log look like? Take the entire table that you have. So you have a customer's table, right? You have customer name, address, number, email, preferred billing method, blah, blah, blah. That's your main table. You'll create one called customer log. It has every single column from that table plus one, plus two, actually. The first one will be an ID, a primary key. And the customer, the ID column on, customer, on the customer's table will become customer ID. And you'll have a log timestamp. And that means that every single time you 
change this record, you copy what was in this before and you put it in the log. If you work for the government, I guarantee you'll see these structures. The government pretty much is required to have this on all their systems now. Uh, most accounting systems have this built in also. They track all this excruciating detail. Uh, this also gives you the ability to undo or to see what the changes were. Um, we have a logging table similar to this on one, on one set of our data structures where I work on, on everything. It's sitting right now at six million rows. The log's been on for two years. It's the second biggest table in the database. I'm talking for space occupied, not actual, you know, size, like of a bunch of data in it. It's the second biggest table just because there's so many records in it. But I know exactly when Tim went and screwed up a package in our system. I can tell exactly when somebody in tech support messed up a customer's record. And I can go over there and go, dude, what's wrong with you? Um, so this is the logging type structures. But for 90% of the systems, this set of fields on pretty much every table will take care of it. Because usually they want to know when was it created, who created it, when was it last changed, and who did it. Um, sometimes they'll have, want to have a what. What changed the difference? That's when you start needing that other table. So you can do the differentials between the different data sets. Uh, differential sucks. Just saying. It's not a fun time. <sighs> okay. This. Turn off. Okay. Two things. <coughs> Number one is the first test. I told you guys we weren't going to be happy. It's the first test. Test one should now be available for everybody's enjoyment. You have one week to do it. It's not right now. Oh, oh I'm going to make you do a two-hour test right now. Like, come on. I saved this for the end of the class. You have one week to do it. You get one attempt. It's a test. It's a test. You get one try. Okay, that's number one. Everything, is, everything you've learned till now. To, as of today. Well, the, 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 it's just a theory test. I don't remember off the top of my head. There are multiple choice. I'd, I'd have to go open the test to answer that, and I don't want to have the question. Yeah, no. Give me a minute, and I'll answer you after. Nice try. Uh, if I remember it, it's 50 questions off the top of my head. You got a week. <laughs> Come on. Multiple choice, open book. Just don't sit next to your friend and say, dude, what's the answer to question number four? You're supposed to do it on your own. I'm trusting you guys to do it on your own, so do it on your own. I've got a week. I, I really, I, I'm assuming you can with Brightspace. I know you could with Blackboard. I have not done a forced submission on it, so I don't know. What? You have, you have, how long do you have to do it? I still understand what you're asking. No, I don't have a time limit on it. So, no time limit. No time limit. People are asking questions and I can't hear them. 
Do I need to talk to you like I talked to the guys out in the hall? You had a question. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> the problem is I can't take the test and try it. So let me know if it does. If, uh, when do you guys try it? If it doesn't work, let me know and I'll let everybody else know. I, they, won't, they did not give me a student account to test this. I can go in and view as a student. I can't hit begin test. I can't test it as a student. I can do it as a teacher, which means nothing. I can see the whole test and I can also look at my answers. There is no time limit. There's no enforced time limit. You have one week to do it. Most people do it in 45 minutes. It should still work. Like, when disconnected, as in halfway through the test? I, I don't know. It's same, the, uh, the same thing would have happened with Blackboard. It would blow up. I don't know. Blackboard didn't take that very easily either. Okay. There we go. All the appropriate dates have been updated. The thing is, is depending on how fast I got through the material, the test would move up and down. We're at the point where you're ready for the test. It starts today. It's due end of day. It's supposed to be due. Yeah, end of day next Tuesday. After the first week, you get 10% off. If you are late with the test, you can still do it, except I'll take 10% off your grade. If you are more than one week late and you're not in the hospital <laughs> and or out of the country for whatever important reason, and there's only, so far I've only found two good reasons to be out of the country. One is you're getting married. B, you're going to somebody's funeral, sometimes at the same time. <laughs> I've seen it. Okay, if, that, if you're out of the country, those are pretty much the only two good excuses. Well, obviously your, your father is not doing well and he's got minutes left to live. You know, that kind of event. That is a valid excuse for why you didn't get it done. However, you probably know before the test expires that this is happening, so let me know ahead of time. If you are more, if you go after the, the, the due date, I will take 10% off the top. You cannot have 100%. Why? Because I gave you a week to do it. Okay, that's the test. Which leads us to the assignment, which there's actually an announcement that goes with this before I continue. There is no lecture next week. I will be here. However, it's not a lecture period. It's to help you with the assignment. There is technically no lab work for next week. It's for the assignment. Yeah, it's a work week. I will be here to every scheduled class to help you guys with your assignments. Therefore, it's not that bad. The assignment is as follows. I am required to have at least one group assignment. Yay. Why do I hate group assignments? One, politics. Because there's always a group. Somebody who can't A, find a group. B, gets kicked out of a group. C, doesn't do any work in the group. So this time I decided to make life a little simpler. It's groups of two. Find a partner. I've actually trimmed back this assignment a bit from what it used to be. It used to actually be bigger than this because I assumed groups of three to four. Now I'm doing groups of two. It's two people working together is easier to manage than a group of three. Theoretically, when you go to the assignment, you should be able to sign up for a group. I really don't know how that works. Hopefully one of you can figure it out because I can't see it. As a teacher, I don't have those buttons. But I've already created it as a as a group as a as a group assignment. That means that as you do the work, only one of you needs to submit it. So you pick the person that actually submits the work. One of you uploads the work to the assignment and I grade it from there. Now, the assignment is two-part assignment. 
the first part is harder than the second part. As usual, not as usual, but as it is. Task number one. This is a direct ripoff of somebody else's assignment. I substituted certain words. But it's essentially the same assignment that is commonly used in other textbooks. And it's a case study. Essentially, you have the dead prime minister high school. Instead of a dead president's high school, it's a dead prime minister's high school. Insert high school here, Sir John A. High School. Or prime ministers you wish were dead. Trudeau High School. You know, take your pick of who you want to talk about. And essentially it's a bit of a story. And then uh, you've been given some data structures that they've identified. Now, these are a bunch of teachers, not database teachers, a bunch of teachers sat around in a room and said, this is what we need to track. It is up to you to take this information dump from a non-computer related person and turn it into a database design. And you're given student data, legal guardian data, the enrollments, disciplinary actions. Bobby was bad today. Extracurricular activities, these are all things that have been identified. Post high school plans. Now, depending where you're from, you know, they actually ask you, what are your future plans? And they make, you do, they make you do it in high school, saying, I plan to do this when you're in grade 10, so they can plan the rest of your high school courses for help you plan your courses. Or are you planning to go to, you know, what universities are you planning to go to, that kind of stuff. So you're going to take this information, you're going to create some third normal relations. You're going to basically create a database diagram for me. And you're going to give me a PG Modeler diagram exported as a PNG. You're going to be graded as follows. Completeness of design. Did you cover all the basics? Everything that was listed in there, can I find it somewhere in your diagram? You're not losing any data. Don't forget sometimes you have to actually add some extra stuff that they didn't think of. How well normalized is the design? As in, did you just create an address and uh, just have a field for province as opposed to actually have like that structure I showed you guys? Proper diagramming and structure. As in, did you actually do the proper naming conventions? Did you actually give proper data types to things? Did you put a person's name and make it an integer? That you're going to lose a point for that. Yeah, I give you guys one free point. Name the file correctly. <laughs> I guarantee 25% of you will lose that point. Prove me wrong. Because historically, it's been higher than 25%. And it's the best. I go, ha, that's funny, zero. Because <laughs> I actually do this whole point at the front where I talk about where it's done a good chunk of the group. Now, Back to the five points for the diagramming and the structure naming conventions, etc. I am draconian when it comes to the naming conventions, as some of you have already heard me repeat myself repeatedly in lab. You have an S. You don't have your S. What the hell is that? Why are you doing this? The way it works is the five points are treated across multiple classes of items. Now. Are your relationships going the right way? Parent-child. Are they actually going the right way, using the right kind of relationship? One-to-many versus one-to-one. -one. Usually, I allocate two points to that out of the five. It doesn't sound like much. I'll take half a point off for each mistake. Naming conventions. That's the next three points. And I just go one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there you go. There's three points gone. I don't even count after that. I used to actually have a section called Five Points Naming Conventions, and that was worth literally five points of the whole grade. Then, you know, apparently that was too much. Um, and once again, I guarantee out of, those, out of that, those, that set of five points, 40% of you will get two out of five. Why? Because apparently people don't know how to follow naming rules. Don't, can't say I didn't warn you. That's task one. Task two. 
And is the file actually there? Oh, bugger. I gotta fix it. There is supposed to be a file in here, and it's not. You have been handed a file by a junior developer. They weren't listening in their database course. You're, you're pretending to be me. You've been given a diagram. It's a shit show. If you don't know what that means, it also means it's a dog's breakfast. If you don't know what that means, it's what the cat threw up in your shoe. And if you just still don't know what that means, it's 99 Rito at 3 a.m. For everybody who lives in Ottawa, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a mess. You're going to fix it. You're going to make sure it's normalized. Maybe it already is normalized. Maybe it's not. Who knows? You're going to make sure that the naming conventions are all fixed, that the relationships are all going to the right place, et cetera, et cetera. And one point for naming your file correctly. Once again, 25% of you will not get this point. Why? Because, and what's the best part is, they'll get the point for the one above, but they won't get it for the second one. Or they'll get it for the second one and not get it for the first one. People laugh when I say it. I'm totally dead serious. How much time do you have to do this? Two weeks. You got one week for the test, which should take you somewhere between four or five minutes to an hour because it's open book. And two weeks for the assignment where I give you four hours of class time to work on it. On top of when you're supposed to, I have no other assigned homework. So you're supposed to have three hours of homework a week, plus an hour of hybrid a week, plus two hours of lab, plus two hours of lecture. Wait a second, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours. Eight hours allocated in one whole week for just this one task. Plus the next week after, which, you know, if you've already done lab four, and you're started out on lab five, you probably don't have that much to do in the lab anyways, therefore it gives you more time to work on it. So you have two whole weeks to finish it, and I gotta make sure my dates are working right on this one, because I bet you they're wrong. Oh no, this one's right. Due date, two weeks. Start date, today. End date, the 19th. It should be showing. You can't see it yet? But you cannot see assignment one at all. All right. Hold on, I'm going to stop my recording.